Ingo Bauman. I welcome Dr. Uh, Ingo Bauman. Uh, once again, it's a real honor and a pleasure to have you with us, Ingo. Uh, I will give you the floor in order to present yourself uh, and to develop uh, the topic of the day, actually. Thank you for being here once again. Yes, yeah, thanks for having me second time. I, the honor is on my side and yeah, good evening to, to all of you. I see we have a very rich participation, much more than last year, so I'm yeah. really impressed. Indeed, uh, we, we do have also uh, a number of officers from the Joint War College, actually, who are following this course as well this yeah. year, you know? Yes. Yeah. Okay, no, very good. Yeah. Thanks a lot for all your interest. Um, yeah, a short uh, introduction to myself, also uh, Ingo Baumann, you can say Ingo if you have questions later on. I'm a partner of BHO Legal. Um, we are a, a medium size, still small law firm of uh, soon 30 people overall including students, including office uh, for the moment is uh, around uh, 18 lawyers. And uh, we have been established in 2008. Um, in fact, my background is uh, from the German Space Agency, DLR, Deutsche Zentrum für Luft und Raumfahrt, where I have worked for seven years before the law firm as an in-house lawyer, uh, and then a bit later, uh, also more in management functions. Uh, um, especially surrounding the uh, European Galileo uh, program, where I have been the head of the DLR Galileo program office and later uh, even the CEO of the uh, German Galileo control center co company. And uh, after that, I decided with two colleagues to establish a law firm. Uh, Why we are quite small, um, in some few areas, we are quite exceptional, uh, leading in Germany in any case, if not even among the leading ones in Europe, and one is certainly space. Um, a few, few more words on this uh, right, right after. Uh, two others where we have really quite special know-how is uh, drones and also the whole geospatial, geo-information, geo-data uh, area. Yeah, some some specialization, typical also normal law firm things we are almost not doing here. We are just dealing with technology projects programs uh, from the side of regulatory, uh, public procurement, uh, public grants, R and D grants, R and D projects, the whole contract side, everything dealing with IT and data law, and. Um, uh, data protection and, and these type of things. Um, yeah, space, uh, maybe just a word. Uh, how, di how did I come to, to the space area when I was a law student rather early? I was more interested in uh, media broadcasting and telecom law. And uh, the German law students, they have to do two mandatory internships. And I selected to do both a bit in the media sector. The first one was uh, in uh, the media supervisory authority of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. And uh, the second one I wanted to do in France, uh, absolutely. And uh, I had some help and I was supposed to do it in Euronews, the, the news television channel. And just a few days before I was supposed to start the internship, somebody called and said, ah, Mr. Baumann, we have to cancel the internship, but it was a mandatory one. So, uh, and during the semester break, so I had to urgently find an alternative and I got again some help and somebody said, yeah, ah, you can go to Utilsat to Paris. I said, Utilsat, what are they doing? Ah, they do broadcasting, but they, they operate broadcasting satellites. Uh, and that was my entry point in 98. And I found it so fascinating that coming back from this internship, I decided to become uh, a space lawyer. And fortunately, in Cologne, we have uh, the eldest uh, air and space law institute in the world. It was even established before uh, Sputnik already in 1952. If I'm not mistaken, today it is led by Professor 
Stefan Hobe, some of you may have heard of, uh, of him or already met him in some conference. Uh, so I went there to the Institute and said, hello, here I am. And so that was uh, the whole, whole starting point. No? And yeah, now the law firm exists since 2008, so since 15 years. And uh, while well, uh, I really do almost nothing else in space industry. From time to time, it's a little bit research project, left and, left and right, um, but re, or geospatial, but I would say nowadays 95 plus percent are in the space industry. That's uh, on so, my So you, you, you are a space lawyer, but you look for clients on Earth, actually. <laughs> uh, yes, at least for the moment, for the time <laughs> being, <laughs> the clients are still on Earth, and no, uh, no green, uh, <laughs> no green uh, men have called me from Mars so far. Unfortunately, <laughs> would be quite interesting. No, uh, of course, no. The the clients are from um, from uh, from Earth, of course, um, mostly from Germany. Um, just to tell you, it's it's about 60, 40. It changes every year a bit. Last year, uh, we had a, a lot of public uh, clients in the space industry, like European Commission, uh, USPA, DLR, German Ministry, and so on and so on. Um, this year, it's, it's uh, at least so far, is really different. Yeah? It's, it's very much uh, from the industry side on contracts, uh, contract stuff, but well, no, overall, I would say 60 public, 40, uh, 40 commercial, and uh, most of them from Germany. But we are, uh, in this area, we really have a European scope. So we do a lot of work for the European Commission, for ESA from time to time, USPA. I was also involved in the drafting of the national space law in the Emirates, UAE. Um, currently, I'm also a member of an advisory board in Saudi Arabia for, for the space strategy. So it's getting more global, let's say. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. And the to, to today lecture is, in fact, is, uh, uh, is a, um, a repetition uh, of last year. Therefore, uh, I also excuse some of the more economic uh, tables and graphs you will see. They are not necessarily the very latest ones. Uh, but if you see them, then it's also easy to get the latest from sources uh, such as Price uh, Tech, one of the leading space uh, market research consultants uh, from the US, etc. If anybody is looking for something specific, I, uh, I just raise questions. Huh? In any case, um, yeah, questions, comments. Uh, welcome. It, it's always a bit difficult to see the chat while while talking, but uh, don't hesitate to raise your hand or to ask something or to put something in the chat and I will try uh, to answer it. I will also try to do the lecture um, as, as free as possible. No? Um, yeah, and let's start. Uh, the topic is new space and national space legislation. Um, well, I don't know your background uh, on national space legislation. Um, in fact, for a very long time, it has not been a topic. Uh, there were very few states like the UK, which adopted a national space law in 86. Uh, uh, so quite a long time ago. But when one of my institute colleagues, uh, PhD colleagues, uh, wrote a thesis, to my knowledge, even the first PhD thesis on the topic in 2002, uh, I think there were something like six or seven uh, national space laws uh, in the world. The US, of course, um, um, Russia, uh, UK, Norway, but while well, basically that's it. Uh, so very, very few countries had adopted national space laws. And, um, and some of these were really old, outdated. Uh, I think one was even going back to, to, to a bit after the adoption of the Outer Space Treaty. So 
it and it was also from from the academic and and even more from the policy side it was not a topic uh, now it has become a, a, a very relevant stream of uh, policy strategy and and legislative uh, activity and the number of national space laws uh, around the globe is increasing let's say basically every month um, just uh, two days ago, I saw something from Malaysia um, and uh, also here in Europe, uh, quite a number of countries are currently uh, working on national space law. Um, yeah, and the lecture is in fact analyzing a bit why new space, no, what we call new space, ma really makes a difference and changes uh, the whole picture of the discussion around uh, national space law. Yeah, that's maybe the introduction. Then I try to, I try to uh, start the slides. Now you should see them. Sure. Yes. And if I now start in the full presentation mode, can you still see it? Yes? Yeah, yeah, sure. It's good. And, and if I move now, it also works, yeah? Okay, perfect. Um, new space, what is new space? In fact, new space is a very disputed term. Why? Because it, uh, it implies no, if there's something like new space, that there's also something like old space. And uh, established companies, big and small, they, they were of course not so happy when the, the term new space appeared and somewhat suggested that well, they are the dinosaurs and outdated and old fashioned and not up to date why a lot of new startup companies are at the forefront and are doing things much better. So it's still a, a disputed term, but we haven't found a better one. Uh, Airbus has introduced the term next space, but uh, it has not made uh, the white round in, in, the, in the global uh, industry. Um, while new space, in fact, also, if you look closer, it has a lot of meanings. No? It has a meaning on the technological side. It has an economic market uh, meaning. Um, it has uh, uh, also um, <clears throat> a kind of policy. Uh, meaning, uh, but um, uh, if, if you look closer, it first of all means another commercialization, privatization wave in the space industry. Of course, we had them in different, in, in different uh, rounds already in the 80s and around 2000, another wave of privatization when also the former intergovernmental organizations were privatized. But now uh, we see, let's say, a new and unprecedented uh, wave um, um, uh, which uh, you can easily understand if you see that in Germany alone, something like 120 new space companies have been founded in the last six, seven, eight years. 120, whereby the old industry players were something maybe like 60. Yeah? So uh, just for Germany alone, you see a massive increase of new companies and, and new businesses and, and plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another um, uh, characteristic of new space is uh, new technologies, um, or to be more precise, um, the full maturity of technologies which have been developed over sometimes over decades um, uh, already, but which are now mature enough uh, to, to go really into the market. Um, there is also increasing use of what we call COTS, commercial off the shelf products which come from other industries which have not been specifically designed for use in space, but which are usable. Uh, and then we see also uh, all the trends which we are seeing also in other industry areas, miniaturization, digitalization, uh, 3D printing, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and while these, these developments, they lead to lower costs, increased production rate and increased production speed. So you can, uh, where you have needed uh, uh, 
in the past two years to build a satellite. Uh, nowadays, at least in some few companies, uh, they do a satellite every day or every second day. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, a massive uh, change with regard uh, to the past. We see also a lot of new business models, um, um, some more futuristic, some uh, extremely real. Um, uh, it goes even up to the, what we call the lunar economy, uh, lunar rovers, uh, mining on the moon and on, uh, and on other uh, celestial body, bodies. But we also talk about satellite constellations for space object surveillance, for radio frequency monitoring, for, uh, um, for AIS, which is uh, um, for, for, um, uh, for maritime applications. ADSB for for uh, for aviation, etc., etc., etc. So lots of lots of new uh, applications and business models. We also see increasing convergence with other sectors. Um, which sorry, sir, to interrupt. We still see the first slide. Ah, okay, that's that's not good. Why is that so? Indeed, yes. Um, you must uh, go to edit mode, not in a presentation mode. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't work here. That's it. It's good. It turned. Yes, but we only see now the new space. Yes, we in see this now number three. We see in, number three. In this mode, it works. Yeah, but if yeah, I switch, uh, if I switch go on, on, yeah, I can go on from here. If you can see it, no, I will. I will make it a bit free in any case. Um, yeah, so no, increasing convergence with other sectors. So, so more and more other industry sectors are using, uh, uh, are using space services, the agriculture market, the automotive market, maritime, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No? Lots, lots of uh, new uh, users in new industry sectors. We see uh, many new actors. Uh, from the, the big uh, space nations, but also a lot from new and emerging uh, countries. Uh, uh, I mentioned already a very high number of startups and what we see is uh, significant uh, private investments. Um, so, so these are, let's say, describing uh, the, the term new space. Um, if you see here this one, it's uh, uh, already a bit older. It was a, a market uh, study of uh, Morgan Stanley, I think something like two, two years ago, uh, which, pre which shows a, a very strong growth uh, already and which also predicts uh, a very strong growth of the overall space sector for the coming years, uh, reaching one trillion dollar in uh, 2040. You know? And uh, the Bank of America even predicted 2.7 trillion in 2040. Whether this is really realistic, we will see, but in any case, we see a very strong growth. Um, for the moment, uh, this is also not the very latest figures, but it's still indicative. Uh, that is the size of the global space economy uh, today, uh, so roughly uh, roughly 400 uh, billion, so uh, up to 2.7 trillion, we still have a way to go. Um, this one here is also not the latest one. It's coming from Seraphim. Seraphim, in fact, is an interesting uh, one. It's uh, from the UK. It, it was the first venture capital fund uh, in Europe fully dedicated to space, only investing into space companies. And they do a lot of market search and they publish a lot of interesting uh, material on their website. So it's certainly recommended not go into details here. The only, the, uh, only takeaway of this slide is really a huge amount of new companies. Um, there are no reliable figures, but some people say in the whole of Europe, it's 800 uh, new space companies uh, which appeared over the last years. Um, which is really massive. Uh, and in all the domains, uh, launchers, uh, operations, constellations, uh, ground segment, um, uh, data business, um, components, software, all, all the elements. Um, 
This slide here shows the development of private investment into uh, uh, space companies. No? And you see uh, a growth since 2012, but a very strong growth, uh, in fact, since now, yeah, 2019 over the last years with a, a big step up in 2021. And in fact, this trend is still increasing in 2002 and likely uh, also in, in 2000. Uh, 23. No? The Ukraine war has uh, reduced a little bit and also the energy crisis and all the other crises we are having currently, they have reduced a bit the venture capital uh, risk appetite, as, as, as they say, uh, but uh, it's already taking up uh, again. Um, however, no, if you look a bit closer, uh, of course, no? very strong growth in private investment, also quite uh, some uh, very visible IPOs um, and uh, lots of new companies, etc. But if you look closer, and this is also interesting, most of the money, in fact, goes to very few players. Um, SpaceX, yeah, Blue Origin, OneWeb, um, Virgin Galactic, okay, some time ago, uh, now they have stopped, if, if you read the news some days ago, uh, now they have stopped uh, all the operations and probably uh, they will disappear. Yeah? Um, so that's, uh, that's one of uh, the latest changes. But these four companies, they attracted uh, really the big bulk of uh, the whole private investment. Um, which also means uh, that if you are in Europe and if you are a small startup company, uh, let's say uh, you may still attract private investment, but in, in completely different ranges. No? One million, two million is rather easy. If you start in the very beginning, angel investment, few hundred thousand. Um, but the, the biggest investments we are seeing in Europe are something like well, around 40 to 50 million. That is the big maximum. For the moment, we only have one exception. And uh, that's interesting because it's also a German company uh, called uh, ISA Aerospace from Munich. They are doing a new type of launcher and uh, they have just made another, what they call C round of investment. And they raised another 165 million on top of uh, something like the same sum of pre-investments they already had in the previous rounds of investment. So this company has raised apparently more than 300 million, uh, but that's really uh, unique in Europe. Uh, the, others, the other biggest ones are around 40, 45. Uh, million huh? and in the billion uh, in the billion uh, range, uh, while well, it's only happening in the U.S. No? The bigger you go, uh, you are in the U.S. Uh, that, that, but that's not specific to space. It's a general problem uh, of Europe that uh, and, and many many politicians uh, talk and complain about it since many many years. That uh, let's say the big tickets are impossible to realize uh, in Europe in all the in all the sectors. Um, it it seems that can I can I say something here, Ringo? Yeah, sure, please. Uh, uh, it seems that you don't need so much money, after all, in order to uh, uh, engage in space activities. Yes, absolutely. It, huh? it, dep it depends what you are doing. Although this de really depends on your market niche, your product, your, your business uh, idea. No? Um, for example, if you, are, if you want to establish a company in the Earth observation area and you are just working with data, yeah? so Copernicus data, other data from, from different type of public and commercial missions, and you specialize to use the data for specific interpretation, like uh, air pollution, water pollution, infrastructure surveillance, whatever it is, yeah? then basically what you need is uh, a few computers, uh, office, uh, uh, office furniture, um, yeah, some rooms, uh, coffee machine, but that's it. Yeah, so your investment into the company uh, only requires a very, very low sum. However, no, if on the other hand, you want to uh, produce a new type of launch vehicle, 
um, uh, including also a new launch range all, uh, and uh, all the security installation, all the testing of your engines, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then still you need several hundred of millions. Huh? So it really depends what you are doing. Uh, we have been advising one of the new mega constellation operators um, um, over the last months. And uh, they, they have just purchased launch services for almost a, uh, a billion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the, the whole overall investment is six billion uh in this in this constellation so how is uh, how is mergers and acquisitions actually in the sector um uh, it's it's predicted it's predicted to become uh much more uh and you already see it yeah but uh the the real wave which is uh announced yeah which many many specialists uh, predict for for the very near future um uh, you see the signs it's starting yeah um, and the most remarkable uh, is probably the news some days ago that Intelsat and SES are in merger talks. Uh, so two of the three biggest uh, uh, satellite operators in the world uh, are talking about a merger. And uh, uh, we, we will certainly see a lot of merger in why the- would, Why would somebody want to merge if not for- uh... Uh, uh, finding uh, uh, funds, resources, financial resources, actually. Uh, but otherwise, why would uh, uh, some companies in the sector would like to merge, actually? Uh, for example, in oil and gas sector, we have a lot of mobility in the M&As. Uh, in pharmaceuticals, we have a lot of, of, of mobility, but uh, because they take advantage of uh, uh, drugs, different types of drugs, and they enrich their uh, uh, mm -hmm. products. But why would two space companies would like to merge, actually? What would drive them? Uh, um, let's start from the other end. Why should uh, space companies not merge? And uh, the main difference... Uh, towards other sectors, like you mentioned, uh, chemical, pharmaceutical, whatever. The main difference is that it is a, a heavy strategic sector. And therefore, the foreign investment control is uh, very strict. Uh, and um, well, in, mm, ah. that's why if you would be, let's say, a US company, and you would like to buy a European space company, yeah, then uh, the uh, investment control, and especially uh, uh, since, well, two, three years, it's really getting much uh, stricter uh, to, uh, in order to keep no, the, what are the latest tr policy trends also in the whole. E so this is, this, uh, is considered, this is considered as a strategic sector for you. Absolutely. Europe, yes? Absolutely, so, no, so and it's you. You yes. have the screening applied, actually. Yes, absolutely, and it's getting stricter and stricter. Yeah, uh, some years ago, uh, a Chinese investor could uh, could get a stake into a European uh, space company. That's over. You would not get uh, the the permission nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's also clear no, the, the space uh, sector, as always, is very close and remains very close to the defense uh, sector. And that's why we have a similar restrictions, written or not, no, written or not, uh, towards uh, the, the merger and acquisition um, world. On the other hand, well, it's the same motivations as you have um in uh in other sectors yeah grow your market dominance by merging yeah? you get bigger you get a, a stronger market position uh, get into get uh, uh the acquire capabilities and also stuff expertise by the way um which you don't have in-house yeah so you just buy in expertise um and in some areas while well, it's also just a normal development uh, after all the trend we have seen the last years. For example, yeah, just take 
Europe, I think we have something like five or six companies minimum in Europe doing space surveillance, commercial space surveillance. But the European market for commercial space surveillance does not allow for six competitors is simply too small yeah so while if they would share the cake they would remain too weak too small so it's also a natural way to uh, to structure let's say very small niche markets mm -hmm. and Defi uh, well uh, defining on the other hand defining the market determining the market for competition law purposes is another intellectual challenge uh for uh space companies yes uh, absolutely no? <laughs> we have we have some examples of competition yeah. um uh, decisions by the uh by the european commission over the last 20 years or so yeah where you can find these market uh, determinations etc it's a it's a very interesting study topic for phd uh, economic phd legal yeah. um, interdisciplinary because by definition the market is global yes yes yeah well yes and no yeah it yes. is it is per se global yeah um on the other hand um um we see also with the ge geopolitical trends overall we see also a very strong renationalization and deglobalization if you want huh? uh, china russia well uh, the the whole collaboration except the iss and and the minimum necessary for the iss the whole collaboration with russia is that uh, with china it's getting it's getting uh, more isolated and more isolated every every uh, some months yeah? and uh, and uh, we also see increasing protection of national players and national markets by even european states so um you you with some justification you could even talk about deglobalization for the moment you know? as as we also see in other areas so, okay Mm -hmm. Well, um, to conclude this, this first uh, introduction, um, now we have all these new players, no? all the new startup companies with new products, services, new applications, new markets, etc., etc. And what are these players asking from uh, the governments? No? They, they ask that the whole new space uh, phen phenomenon is considered in updated space policies and strategies which uh, uh, is, is uh, by far not the case yet. No? If you look, for example, again to Germany, our national space strategy dates from 2010, uh, 13 years old. The term new space was in Europe, at least, it was not even existing in 2010. And the whole uh, creation of all these startup companies at best was predicted by some experts if at all. Yeah, so so the, the German policy and strategy is certainly outdated in this to in this um, in this end. And here with the second point, we are coming to the core topic of the lecture, lightweight regulatory regimes. Hey, I'm just a startup. I'm small. We are only five people. Now I have to run through whole the licensing process under national space. So please make it simple. Please make it lightweight. Please make it easy for startups, etc., etc. We will come back to this. Um, then another uh, claim of, of uh, all these new players is, let's say, public co-investment. Yeah, that uh, uh, in addition to venture capital, private capital, the, the state is co-investing. Um, and that's happening. European Investment Bank, European Investment Fund, uh, uh, some national, uh, national um, uh, uh, banks, um, are, are, are having, let's say, space funds or doing space investments uh, that's happening. Um, then public support to accelerators, incubators, prices, etc. Here we have a lot uh, happening uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure about Greece, uh, but I think you also have a Bisa, uh, Isabic, 
either business incubation center somewhere, even if I'm not, not sure where it is. Um, either business incubation center is in fact, is a, is a startup creation environment. Yeah, you get very cheap office space, you get 50,000 euro support, you get a lot of mentoring, you get a lot of help with networking, um, et cetera, et cetera. No, 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 we don't actually. Oh. Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we have been through uh, an attempt to create a, a state body, actually, which failed, a separate state body, a separate entity. Mm -hmm. and then now it's back to the ministry, which is, and now, and now the Academy of Athens, they have taken the initiative to create a center, uh, but it's only on paper. Oh, okay. Uh, now. So okay. we are really, yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, also I personally, I do a lot of mentoring nowadays. Uh, I would have never thought so, but since three years, I, I get requests and requests and requests to do mentoring in, in uh, these different startup uh, accelerators and incubators. For example, there is now a German French uh, space founder uh, initiative. Um, the, in France, there is a Starburst, which is a US uh, venture capital firm. They also have their own accelerator program, mentoring program. So this, there's really a good, uh, a good landscape uh, helping the startups, especially in the very early phase. Then research and development grants, uh, procurement, and uh, uh, um, under the t t in relation to procurement, um, and this is one of the biggest topics uh, on the political side, um, these companies, they say, hey, we don't want so much research grants. We, we, we are not really developing like universities or research organizations, technologies for the next 10 years. We are going into the market now. So instead of research money, we want to have contracts you the state please buy please buy what we are producing and therefore uh, these terms here first buyer the state as first buyer uh, the state as anchor customer or anchor tenant is the us term for this um, or doing space projects programs in public private partnerships this is really a very very strong um, uh, political demand from the industry, and there's a lot of um, activities ongoing. Uh, just uh, for, for just to give you an example, just before Christmas, we did a, st uh, a small study on anchor customer approaches for the German Space Agency, and some weeks later, uh, there was a workshop with the German industry, and uh, we presented our study results, and then uh, it was discussed how the situation on in Germany can be improve because the German national space budget is mostly spent on research support, but not on procurements. Uh, so uh, that's another thing. Yeah, export support, export credits, export loans, political support, um, ensuring fair competition, technical advice, use of test facilities. These are other uh, claims and uh, questions by the industry towards the state. Um, taking up uh, these new space impact on space policy and strategy, just to give you some examples. I will go a bit, bit faster here, otherwise we lose, lose too, too much time. Uh, I already mentioned the example of Germany, national space strategy, outdated, 13 years old. You know? And uh, so uh, what, we, what we see is, is now a trend, let's say, that countries with existing national space policies and strategies, they are updating, reforming uh, these strategies. And we also see quite a number of new countries, uh, which have not been very strong, uh, very important players in the space industry so far, now coming out with also seeing new chances in this new space environment, yeah? and uh, coming up with space strategies, policies for the very first time. Uh, Malta may be an example for, for the late, later ones. Uh, Saudi Arabia is also, uh, or the, in, in fact, all uh, Arabian countries, also Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, etc. Um, they are coming up with uh, space uh, strategies now. And um, 
if, if you see if here some examples, we, you don't have to read everything, but uh, already the EU space strategy from 2016, even if it's rather old, um, at least already recognized the development, huh? new opportunities, innovative products, competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera, uh, new space. So, so it was quite early, but nevertheless, the current EU space strategy already recognizes the new space phenomenon and has certain elements at least um, uh, based on, on new considerations. Also the uh, EU ESA Space Council, the last one took part in 2020, also recognized uh, new space. Um, uh, you will get the slides afterwards. No? So uh, the, where we have a lot of text, you can, you can do the reading later. Thank um, you, thank you. Yeah? Um, uh, for Germany, no, I, I already mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned it. Uh, in fact, now currently the G German government is working on a new strategy. Officially, they say it will be published in October. Nobody really believes uh, this will be the case. It will probably take a bit longer, but the official announcement is for October. Um, yeah, Luxembourg, no, many of you may have heard, Luxembourg has probably been one of the countries which recognized the new trend uh, the earliest and also tried to get uh, a first winner, first mover advantage out of it. And mainly with uh, space mining. Uh, so in 2016, Luxembourg initiated already the space resources initiative and uh, also created as one of the first countries in the world a legal framework for for mining uh, activities which uh, provides us a very short uh, uh, regime which allows that in fact company doing space mining are allowed to become also the owner of uh, what they uh, exploit you know? And uh, in fact, you, you can discuss a lot about Luxembourg and, and so on and so on, but what they have, um, what they have uh, reached is that the, their national sector has grown tremendously. A uh, huge amount of new companies uh, uh, attracted by Luxembourg. Huh? Um, and so, so that's certainly a good example. Uh, Finland has updated space strategy in 2018, already in response to new space. Yeah. And uh, no, you see here, Finland is the world's most attractive and agile space business environment by 2025. Well, no, whether this will be reached is another question, as many other countries try to reach the same, but at least you see the goal. And uh, also the UK, they, uh, um, up, uh, they adopted a new national space strategy in 2021. No? And you see something similar, make the UK one of the most attractive countries for space sector businesses of all sizes and for talent to grow and thrive, et cetera. Hmm? And <clears throat> um, if you see the latest figures, they have been published also some time ago, um, at least they have partially reached the goal. They have seen a very strong growth of private investment, new companies and overall uh, sector growth. Uh, and this trend is now uh, continuing. You know? As I said, more and more countries are updating their existing strategies, now fully taking into account uh, all these new space developments um, and uh, many new uh, countries also uh, try to take uh, to get a, a, a piece of the cake, let's say. Um, on the other hand, no? strategies, okay, policies, okay, demand by industry, okay. But if we see, uh, in fact, the development of national space budgets, uh, we don't really see this big growth. It's uh, also a bit self-explaining, at least for the last years, no? energy crisis, Ukraine war, um, COVID investment, financial crisis, banking crisis, I don't know, uh, climate crisis, I don't know how many crises uh, we have. And of course, the countries have to invest uh, massively uh, to cope with these different crises. 
and uh, and uh, to uh, to uh, to help the population with very basic things like energy costs. And in, in this environment, of course, uh, it's very difficult for space lobbyists to convince parliamentarians uh, uh, to to give more money to space. Uh, especially as in typically in population, if you make surveys, people say, hey, why should we spend so much money for space? We have so many problems on Earth. Let's better spend the money on Earth. Mm? So that's a typical, uh, typical result of surveys in, in the population. So we don't really see um, uh, the, the same growth as, as we have seen from private uh, investment, et cetera, we don't see so much um, on, uh, on the public budget side. Sometimes we even see decreasing uh, national space budgets, no? simply because uh, too many other uh, more urgent and bigger, uh, bigger problems and crises. Uh, this slide here gives you a little nice overview of the spending uh, globally, and while without even thinking about it, you, you see that the US is so far away of everybody else uh, that um, uh, it's really it's really massive. No? And the biggest uh, difference is, is of course uh, the military and intelligence uh, services, where uh, no other country has anything comparable. And if, even if you combine everything we do in Europe, uh, EU level, ESA level, and national levels, uh, we are very far uh, away from the uh, total US uh, budgets. Um, you even see it also here for the uh, European space program budget uh, that in fact, this was here the budget which was uh, demanded, proposed by the European Commission, and you see what was in the end adopted by the Council and the Parliament. No? So uh, even if it is already some time ago, uh, uh, you, you see already also the COVID crisis uh, making uh, pressure on the uh, EU space budget. And, and here you see, in fact, it's not the latest figure, uh, and it should show the 2022 ESA ministerial uh, figure. So though this is a slide I should have updated uh, uh, for today. But uh, um, again, yeah, uh, it was a very, very big struggle. In the end, uh, what the ESA director general proposed to member states was more or less reached but as usual also in the last minute. No? So, and, and this uh, is then the illustration. Um, if the public space budgets are not heavily increasing, but you have a huge amount of new players, then by nature, it's like a party, it's like a birthday party. Yeah, you invited 10, but in the end, uh, 20 are coming, while the, every, the, everybody's piece of the cake is getting uh, smaller, And that's also why, for example, in Germany, also other countries, the established uh, space companies, uh, which are often also medium sized family businesses, uh, they are not really happy about all these new startups, uh, because they, they take away attention, they take away uh, public budgets, and uh, they are new competitors. Uh, the, the, the traditional market was quite structured among few players uh, and very, a very safe market from the company perspective. Now it's really getting wild uh, uh, up to wild, wild west. You know? um, so that concludes this part. Um, this one here. Um, yeah, this is just showing you again how many different support initiatives we have to help startups in the early or also in a bit uh, later phase. Hmm? Um, uh, we have a lot of prizes, Copernicus Masters, Galileo Masters, EIC Launch Prize. Um, we have uh, EIC Accelerator. Uh, invest EU, uh, EU Cassini, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For those of you who want to establish a, a startup company in the space area, uh, you should have a closer look to it. Um, but for for the others, it's just important to see how many different types of initiatives uh, we have: no? uh, public, private, or mixed. No? So, so if there is really a very good what we call ecosystem nowadays, uh, helping 
uh, young founders to, to establish um, uh, a space startup company. So after all that, coming a bit to the legal, legal side, impact, impact on space law and impact of space law. Um, well, uh, uh, you all know, let's say the current uh, uh, international space law framework uh, composed of the few uh, treaties, outer space treaty, liability convention, registration convention, rescue agreement and moon agreement, and a certain set of uh, principal uh, uh, resolutions and non-binding uh, instruments. In fact, all the different principal resolutions uh, they are quite outdated no? uh, and not so relevant in practice, but uh, the, the two which really need to be hi highlighted are the UN Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines and uh, the Long-Term Sustainability Guidelines. No? They, these two guidelines documents, uh, they, they have quite a, quite a high impact, even if they are uh, non-binding. We will come back uh, to this. And well, if you look to the Outer Space Treaty, there are a few relevant uh, provisions. Uh, if we talk about private space activities, commercial space activities in general, and um, um, Article 2, uh, I just mentioned here because it's so important in the context of the whole space resources, space mining discussion, that in fact outer space is not subject to national appropriation by claim of serenity, by means of use or occupation or by other means. That is really uh, 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 the key provision if we talk about space resources and space mining. But more generally, Article 6, Article 7, Article 8. And uh, uh, just to take out the, the essence, no? um, states, parties shall be international responsibility for national activities, yeah? whether such activities are carried out by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and for ensuring that national activities are carried out in conformity with the provisions set forth in the treaty. Yeah? The activities of non-governmental entities shall require authorization and continu continuing supervision by the appropriate state. Yeah? So in, in fact, that demands of all countries um, uh, party to the Outer Space Treaty, that in fact, if they have non-governmental, meaning also private commercial activities, they need to be subject to authorization and to supervision. This, the second article seven establishes state liability for uh, uh, outer space ac activities, you know, the famous launching state, the famous international uh, liability. And let's say, if you are a responsible state, then you are also liable for damage caused by your non-governmental entities. And that's one of the key drivers for national space legislation, as we will just see in a, in a second. And uh, finally, Article uh, 8, yeah, the, the need for national, um, uh, for, for, um, uh, for national registration and also notification uh, then of uh, space objects to the UN International uh, Register and the linkage between registration and jurisdiction and control. Now, we are not going into details of the international space law today. I just picked out these things because these elements are in fact causing either the need yeah, or at least the, the interest of the state to adopt national space law. You have to ensure um, authorization and supervision. Yeah? You have to ensure registration. And um, while you may want to do something with your state liability, if in fact a damage has been caused by uh, a private company. And um, interesting in this regard is uh, in fact uh, also the uh, long-term sustainability guidelines. Even if they are specifically dealing with sustainability aspects, they nevertheless include quite, a, quite some interesting elements um, also um, 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 uh, on national space uh, legislation. Yeah? So uh, interesting to, to, to read the document also 
um, um, uh, under this uh, under this heading. No? So, so for example, you, you read here: states should adopt, revise, or amend regulatory frameworks to ensure the effective application of relevant, generally accepted international norms, standards, and practices for the safe conduct of outer space activities. No? In developing, revising, and amending national regulatory frameworks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I let you read that. Uh, um, uh, uh, when you have, when you find the time, or if, if you are interested in, in more details, it's just to see that, in fact, um, uh, a, a strong driver for national space law is now, and, and that's a rather recent development since maybe four or five years only, uh, is also increasingly coming now from the uh, sustainability and environmental protection. Um, uh, perspective, uh, which was really not the not so much the case um, before. And uh, last but not least, in fact, if you look a bit to the history of national space legislation, uh, well, some years ago, uh, let's say let's say 15, 15, 20 years ago, there were if you had a discussion on national space law, it was purely coming from the international law perspective. Ah, yes, ah, the Outer Space Treaty, ah, authorization, supervision, ah, we are bound by the international law, so we have to adopt national space legislation. Yeah, so the, the, the logic was, okay, as a state, we have our international obligations, and in order to implement the international obligations, we should or we have to do a national space law. Um, However, no, if you read now the different, as we have seen before, the different new strategies, new policies, etc., it's completely different. Now it's about competitiveness of the national space industry, um, 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 in uh, growth, new jobs, um, um, mm, um, lead, global leadership, um, innovation. Uh, all these all these terms yeah so in fact what we are seeing now is is a very strong focus on economics yeah we are doing something in on the space sector in fact to be more competitive to be more innovative to create new companies grow economic growth etc cetera, etc cetera. and this uh, new policy focus now also impacts on national space legislation. And, and we have seen before some of the quotation extracts, which I have copied you know, from the different national uh, space strategies. We would like to create a, a, a regulatory framework which ensures uh, leadership of our national industry, which attracts new companies, which stimulates innovation, which et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So in fact, the uh, national space legislation aims and objectives are now also more and more economic. Huh? And um, um, this has a very strong uh, impact as we will, as we will just see. Um, however, no, if, if you, instead of just coping with your international law obligations and with a focus on authorization and supervision, maybe also with a focus of ensuring safety, sustainability, environmental protection, etc. Yeah. Um, if now your policy aim of such a legislation is more to attract companies and to stimulate growth and to, to, to foster competitiveness, you will have a different approach to such legislation. And it goes uh, uh, in hand in hand with, in fact, the, the claims, the demand uh, of the industry, especially the startup company, towards a more lightweight, uh, uh, fast, easy um, uh, regulatory uh, regime. No? Now, what is, if you look a bit more from, from a whole European or even global perspective, what does it mean? No? It means that there is a risk of what we call forum shopping. That as a company, no? if you are flexible enough uh, with your people, with your investment, with whatever you, your situation, yeah? and you, you have the choice of country where to go. 
then you can select the country with the lowest level regulation. As we have seen in the maritime sector since decades uh, with uh, the, the flex of convenience, where in fact uh, uh, most of the ships around the globe are registered in Panama and uh, comparable uh, countries. Now, we could also easily imagine a situation of a country like Panama having a very, very lightweight industry-friendly national space law, where then operators, startup companies from all over, they go to this country because it's so easy. And in fact, we have seen without it's my turn to criticize any country, uh, but at least we have seen some countries really going into uh, this direction, as we will also see uh, a few slides, uh, a few slides um, later, where I have some some extracts on this. No? So, so that's uh, the concern um, that, in fact, it's a it's a downwards uh, development. No? Uh, just take, for example. Uh, Germany and France. No? So the French uh, uh, space law is introducing 50 million liability cap, yeah? then the Germans do 40, then the French do 30, then the Germans do 20, and so on and so forth, no? just as a stupid example. Um, um, okay. In fact, where, when are we stopping? Uh, 9.30? Oh, uh, uh, any? It depends. It depends it, on your work. Uh, how oh, much you are, yeah. I. Uh, I think you are, no. Uh, uh, no, I, I have no restrictions in the end, but I just don't want to no. take too much okay. of your, too much of your time. Uh, <laughs> let's say. Yes. Uh, as, as, yeah. Um, normally, uh, it's <laughs> normally nine o'clock, actually. Yes. Oh, okay. Lots yeah. of lots of time then. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. or, um, or, or we, we, we can stop earlier. It's, uh, no, 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 no problem, no problem. Yeah. Um, and while no, now, <clears throat> now, in fact, all these uh, new developments, they also put put a lot of pressure on uh, on the existing regime. Everybody of us knows outer space treaty out while well, key print principles which are eternal, but it lacks the detailed and the, uh, the modernness uh, to answer nowadays question, uh, starting with the famous discussion about uh, space resources, but there are also lots of lots of other uh, lots of other issues. No? For example, company uh, company, I don't know, A from a certain country, uh, uh, launches, operates a satellite, but later sells it to operator B from another country. Well, but the satellite is already entered into the register of the first country. How can you transfer yeah, uh, the satellite from uh, country A register to country B register? What do we do with on-orbit servicing, where in fact uh, a service, servicing satellite comes, attaches to the serviced satellite, and uh, uh, provides fuel or uh, or uh, lifetime extension services? Now the two objects are really connected to each other, and in the case of life extension, they are connected for years until end of life. Uh, is it two objects? Is it one object in which register? Who is responsible? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we have dozens and more new legal questions coming out of, in fact, these new technologies and, and new uh, applications, but also um, uh, uh, simply due to the increase of the space activities, and that leads us, of course, to the issue of space debris. Uh, and it also leads us to the discussion around a future uh, space traffic management. No? Um, so there's, uh, at least for academics, uh, a huge amount of very interesting questions uh, to be analyzed in master thesis or PhD or whatever uh, you want to do. No? Um, It all leads yeah, to an increase of importance of national space legislation, because while the international regime is not developing, yeah, since uh, the Moon Agreement in 85, we have nothing 
no new treaties, no new binding rules at all. The only thing are uh, technical standards and non-binding guidelines, but otherwise the law is not developing. Yeah? And uh, uh, therefore, in fact, all the new regulations, they need to be done on national level. And um, um, <clears throat> uh, in fact, is of course the national law and in practice, it is then the licensing process under such a national law. So as a company, while you do, you want to do certain activities, you are in a country with a national space law. So you have to go to the competent authority and ask for a license and they have to run through the whole license, uh, uh, licensing process until you have the license in hand. And then under the license, you have a lot of reporting obligations. Uh, if you do bad things, your license may be revoked or suspended. You may have to, to pay fines and penalties, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So uh, it gets, uh, increasing important. Um, <clears throat> and let's say, as I mentioned, some of the key new issues on international side, there are also really lots of new legal questions on the national side. Huh? Material scope of national space legislation, just one example. We have a lot of older national space laws which were written in a certain way, tailored for a, a certain national industry at the time. Imagine uh, 20 years ago in a certain country, there was only one geostationary orbit operator with one satellite. But now 20 years later, you have two micro launcher companies, one earth observation company, one lunar company, one et cetera, et cetera. So if the national law has a, a very tailored limited scope, then with the broadening of activities, some of the activities may not even be covered by the law. So uh, that's uh, then an issue. Personal territorial scope of national space legislation, that's also an issue, uh, especially, for example, in Germany. Now we have, th uh, we have three micro launcher companies, but none of these is launching from Germany. Uh, one is launching from the UK uh, and uh, uh, one from Norway. For the third one, we don't know yet. And, uh, but it will also not be from Germany. So in fact, now, while a, a German company producing the launchers in Germany is launching, in fact, from another country. No? Is now the launching state is Germany? or is it the country from where the launch takes place or both? And if it's both, how do they deal with each other, et cetera. Another big topic, uh, scope of a single license. What do I mean uh, by this? Uh, some, some national space laws are written in a way that it's per, the license is per activity. So if you launch a satellite, you need a license. If you launch two satellites, also one after the other, no? one in 2023, the next one in 2024, you need a license again. That implies if you operate a constellation of let's say 1000 satellites, yeah, in, in theory, you would need 1000 different licenses per space object, per operational activity. Well, that's of course makes no sense uh, at all. Therefore, very few countries uh, so far, and, and some are working on it now, are now creating special license approaches for constellations, where you go once to the authority, you say, I want to launch 100 satellites, I want to have a license for 100 satellites, and you have the possibility to get a, a company or a constellation uh, license. Yeah? But uh, that's a very interesting topic, uh, which alone we could do a, a nice lecture on this. Um, duration of licensing procedure is a key issue. Um, uh, for those interested, um, Virgin Orbit, we already mentioned, uh, they, some time ago, they had the first launch attempt from the UK. Uh, it failed uh, uh, for technological for technology reasons, but if you read the press, uh, it was very little about the the, the failure of uh, Virgin Orbit, but it was a lot of discussion why it took so long 
for the UK licensing authority to issue the license to Virgin Orbit for this first UK launch. It took almost two years, almost two years of licensing process. Well, now imagine you're a startup company, you have your investors, you are ready to go to market. Yeah? And now the, re the regulator tells you, yeah, well, you have to count two years until you get the license. And of course, you're not allowed to start with the activity before you have the license. So what are you doing? Yeah? Uh, how do you pay your stuff uh, for two years, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So one of the key issues uh, uh, in practice, duration of the licensing procedure, also licensing fees, also requirements on uh, professional technical capacity. Well, uh, on this also easy example, you come out from university with three other friends, you establish your uh, startup company, you, you buy a satellite in one year is ready, and you start you want to launch uh, your satellite. Now you go to your licensing authority and you say yes, but we require that the key engineers have at least 10 years of experience. Okay. Yeah, you're just coming out of university. How can you ensure 10 years of professional expertise? Uh, simply not possible. Uh, liability insurance and space debris uh, mitigation, of course, two other key issues. Um, um, yeah, this goes just a bit into details of these, uh, of these issues. Uh, material scope, I think I mentioned already. Yeah. Um, yeah, the scope of a single license towards a constellation. I mentioned the licensing fees. Uh, I also, uh, I also mentioned. Um, just to tell you, uh, it depends. It, if you make comparison um, among different national space laws, the license fees they go from zero. Several countries have adopted uh, in their law that in fact it's free. Yeah. You don't pay any, uh, any license fees. In other countries, it can go up to hundreds of thousands of euros, the overall license fees, because it's not only the license fee, you also pay for the costs and effort of the licensing authority. So if they have to do special analysis, if they have to do certain testing activities, you pay. Yeah? And this can sum up to half a million uh, half a million uh, euro or dollar just uh, just as license fees, and of course, no, this has a very uh, significant uh, uh, um, uh, also competitive disadvantage. If your competitor from country A pays zero, but you have to pay five hundred thousand and you have to wait two years uh, for your license, uh, it's a big issue. You know? uh, the professional activity I mentioned. So let's let's jump a bit on on liability. Um, most of you know no, uh, that, uh, in fact, coping with the international liability of the state, most national space laws, they introduce that, in fact, if the state uh, has to pay compensation under the international regime, that then it can recover uh, the related uh, costs from the private company. No? So if the company is causing a damage, the state is liable under the international law and has to pay, then the state <coughs> takes recourse uh, from the company. And typically this is combined with a certain liability cap or, or limit of recourse. Um, and the limit of recourse then is coupled with a mandatory insurance. So that the state, if the case happens, can be sure that the, the compensation, the recourse uh, amount is uh, secured. No? So that's uh, the traditional uh, approach. If you look uh, again, comparing lots of different space laws, um, they are extremely different. Uh, in Europe, however, over the last years, uh, a kind of common approach, if you would like to call it that way, has materialized based on the 2008 French uh, national space law, which introduced a liability cap of 60 million. And uh, a, a, a few time later, the UK has then introduced 50 million. Yeah, and But something like 50 to 60 million was in fact the European average uh, amount 
and the insurance market was also used to cover such an uh, amount and it was in fact uh, independent of the activity. Yeah, whether you were UTELSAT and you were operating a geostationary satellite or whether you were uh, Ariane Spass and launching an Ariane 5, 60 million. Now, with uh, all the new trends, uh, microsatellites, nanosatellites, small satellites overall, constellations, um, and new and very risky uh, technologies and, uh, and business models. Um, there's a lot of question marks and pressures on this traditional, let's say traditional regime of having a fixed liability cap. Imagine um, you are a small uh, you, uh, startup company, again, out of university. In the university, you have, uh, you had your, your very small satellite project where you have built a kind, some, some kind of CubeSat. And now you want to establish your company based on these type of CubeSats. The CubeSat costs 100K. Uh, the launch cost for the CubeSat is another 100K. So the overall project costs 200K. Uh, Okay, now you have to take out a 60 million insurance for a 200K satellite. The insurance premiums alone, 2% um, uh, of uh, 60 million, uh, 60, uh, 120,000. Yeah? 100, 120,000 insurance costs for a project of 200,000. That's of course, obviously not in relation uh, to um, the value of your project and, and your business. So all these companies, they say, hey, uh, we cannot, we can, you, you have to do something, legislator, regulator, we cannot, for, for a project of our size, yeah, we cannot take um, 60 million. On the other hand, yeah, you may also have a, a completely new launcher, launching for the very first time and having a, a, a launch uh, phase which leads over territory of other countries and this launch vehicle has never been tested before okay the liability probability and the risk may be much higher than 60 million no? so in short in short where is this leading to it leads that well it's maybe a bit too early to say the latest trend the new trend but I would say yes, is to go away from these fixed uh, sums like 60 million to a more individual uh, um, analysis of the risk and then an individual fixation of uh, the liability cap. So that in fact, a university project uh, from a group of students may be totally exempted, yeah? no insurance requirement. Um, uh, a very small satellite, uh, however, which fulfills certain, certain safety criteria may only have an insurance requirement, let's say, of 2 million. Yeah? Um, uh, the first prototype uh, on-orbit servicing mission, which is super risky yeah, with collision and space debris, etc., may, however, have an insurance requirement of 200 million, etc., etc. So, and, and there, there are some countries and some consultants developing formulas and mathematic models and software and in the future certainly even uh, AI tools to make uh, the risk evaluation. No? Um, it's typically called maximum probable loss uh, uh, calculation. Uh, so you calculate what could be the maximum loss, and then you derive with certain other criteria, you derive the, the value of the liability of the liability cap. For the moment, the UK is really at the forefront uh, here. Um, <clears throat> they develop, uh, in fact, approaches for constellation. They develop approaches for on-orbit servicing. Uh, they have introduced, or they are about to introduce a kind of point system where in get, you, get, uh, you get certain markings, no? uh, environmental friendly, okay, plus, uh, uh, but not so safe, okay, minus, et cetera. And then based on the points, your insurance requirements are calculated. That's really extremely modern, but it also means a lot of effort on the regulatory authority. And through the effort, it also means it takes quite a long time yeah? and effort to determine this. 
Okay. Um, yeah, coming closely to the end. Maybe just a few few words on um, space debris uh, mitigation. Most of you have seen these famous illustrations where we see the millions of small objects circulating uh, around the Earth and how much we have destroyed our near Earth <clears throat> uh, environment. Yeah. On the other hand, we only have for the moment very few technical standards. Some of them are extremely outdated. For example, the, the relevant ITU recommendation on space debris is from 98, 98, uh, 25 years old, and it only applies to geosta uh, geostationary orbit. Uh, the, U <clears throat> the IADC and UN guidelines are <clears throat> 2007, 2010. Also, no, 13, 15 to 13, 15 years old. They don't cover uh, the medium Earth orbit. They don't cover uh, uh, um, non-orbital like Luna uh, or asteroid or Mars or whatever in the future activities. They just cover the Earth orbits, and they have the famous 25-year uh, rule, yeah, where in fact. Uh, uh, you need to design and operate your satellite that it disappears only in 25 years. And everybody now says this is way too long, 25 years. No? And the US FCC, also the national regulator of the US, has already now established very recently a new requirement, in fact, going down to five years. Yeah? So if you are a US operator, you have to ensure removal of your uh, debris uh, within five years instead of 25. And let's say over the last three, four years, um, all these environmental sustainability topics, they have increased massively. Also some years ago, uh, maybe it was mentioned, ah, yeah, it's a problem. Ah, yeah, it's basically. So now it's, it's really number one topic everywhere. And uh, the, some of you may know that the EU has uh, just announced uh, that they might work on an EU space law. And the key driver, in fact, are safety, also safety of operations, collision avoidance, debris avoidance, debris uh, removal. Yeah. And uh, if you look for, again to Germany, we have a, a, a coalition uh, government with a Green Party. And uh, the, the, uh, by the way, the Ministry of Economy is led by the Green Party. And they are now putting on the new, new national space uh, strategy of Germany and also on the national prospective space law of Germany, uh, which is not yet existing. They are putting climate, sustainability, environment protection at the forefront of their policy aims uh, uh, in, in Germany. No? So, um, um, yes. Um, some people over the past years have said, hey, we are really moving into a wild west. Um, and we have, to, in fact, we have seen a few examples of these and um, mostly from the US, we have to say, yeah, uh, Wild West cowboy style uh, have been also the terms. And, and this year, what, uh, what you see on this slide was just one example. There was a, a new company, startup company with very, very small satellites, really uh, extremely small satellites. And uh, they uh, requested a, a license to launch uh, these uh, very small satellites. But the, uh, the license, as I said, uh, uh, took quite a while and they had booked already a launch. And then they had to decide, okay, what do we do? If we wait for the license, we have to postpone the launch or we launch. Uh, and what they did is they decided, okay, we have no license yet, but uh, the launch is booked. So let's launch uh, without permission. This company had to pay $900,000 as a fine yeah, for launching without, uh, without a license. Um, if you look around, most 
most of the other complaints, most of the other discussion is always surrounding one person or one company and is uh, our famous Elon Musk. Yeah? Um, the whole discussion of astronomy, you know, the dark sky, uh, dark sky and the impact of big constellations on astronomy driven by SpaceX. The whole discussion of monopolization of certain space uh, near, near Earth orbits, SpaceX, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's very much driven by, by one company uh, alone. But also because Elon Musk is as he is, no? as he wrote his own law for Mars, no? saying, okay, we will, uh, once uh, we have a colony on Mars, uh, we will write our own laws uh, and we will get uh, independent. Well, this guy, he simply does what he wants. No? And he's so powerful nowadays that nobody really can stop him. And uh, that's uh, what he is also doing with SpaceX and also trying to do uh, with uh, Starlink. No? Um, so this comes to the to the conclusion. Uh, and in fact, so so what we have seen is that uh, national space law once uh, a rather academic topic, with quite a few countries in the world having national space law and a rather stable one, yeah? the UK Outer Space Act from 86, it was not reformed until 2018. Yeah? So it remained stable for almost 30 years, no changes, no amendments. Now we see around the globe, uh, countries doing reforms, reviews, amendments of the existing laws or creating new laws. And once they are ready, they are already initiating the next reform. So, uh, uh, and, and more and more countries adopting national space law. Uh, we have seen that the, the focus uh, uh, has evolved from a more or less purely international law perspective. Uh, the Outer Space Treaty asked me to authorize and supervise, so I have an international obligation, etc. Now more to a tool of economic policy, and maybe in the next step also as a tool of environmental uh, policy. And um, on the other hand, no, due to the competitiveness, all the startup companies, a lot of pressure on the legislators, on the regulators to reduce license procedures, uh, duration to uh, reduce or even lift uh, fees for the license to, to, to have a more flexible and lower demand for liability and insurance. <clears throat> and overall, uh, to create an, a regulatory framework which stimulates and supports uh, the national uh, space uh, industry. Yeah, and with this, I conclude, let's say, with the slides, and we can move to questions and discussions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ingo. That was really amazing. Uh, 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 as always, uh, this field, this discipline is very much challenging intellectually. Um, we moved actually from a totally uh, public sector owned uh, activity to uh, private sector dominated activity. Yes, uh, and uh, the states who used to be the owners uh, both of the infrastructure, the equipment and the activities and the, the monopoly actually, now they turn into regulators and they leave room for uh, a private private sector, private entities to uh, exploit uh, space. Uh, I don't know to what extent all the lessons that we have learned from the transformation of energy sectors and uh, telecom sectors uh, can be applicable to uh, space as well 
in order to open up markets to private companies on the one hand, uh, invite, encourage competition, which is also a big challenge uh, since uh, we need financing for activities and uh, we need to open up competition to uh, private entities. Now, would uh, a licensing process like the spectrum process, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the spectrum when you give out uh, parts of the spectrum to different companies, would it be an appropriate tool, actually, for licensing purposes? Uh, uh, in order to guarantee, because there are too many constraints and too many restrictions from the regulator, uh, and uh, I don't know whether this uh, access access to the to the activities to space activities to the profession actually is uh, more or less rather free. Yes, I mean there are there is a general license in uh, most uh, most. Uh, countries, most domestic legal orders, <clears throat> you don't have to obtain a specific license for, or yes, for for uh, <clears throat> space activities, like uh, uh, as you obtain a specific license in order to exploit a specific spectrum, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is your... Uh, reaction to this um yeah, starting from 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 the back um of course we have the freedom of use no so so that applies to states but it also in general applies to country uh, to to companies <clears throat> and uh, comparable let's say also a huge amount of space companies is not falling under national space law. If you are just producing some satellite comp component like batteries or solar panels or, or star sensors or whatever, while well, you are not you are not operating yourself. No? And if, if I look, for example, to the German scene, uh, 120 new startup companies out of the 120, it's maybe 10%, 10% of the companies are, uh, op are intending to do space operations, launcher or, or satellite or, or, or lunar rover, one or two. Yeah, properly, but, uh, properly yeah. space <clears throat> operations. Yeah? And all the other companies, of course, they are not, not falling under national space law. Um, the, the difference with um, the telecom energy law is that uh, um, they were former state monopolies broken up no? and then uh, an, an open market introduced. What we, of course, we also have the big monopolist like Airbus and uh, Ariane Spas, et cetera, but it's not, this, it's not really the same, uh, the same situation. Mm? Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit different. Um, and the, the frequency, uh, the telecom law, of course, goes hand in hand. Yeah? So far that uh, in the US, the FCC is even responsible for both. They are issuing frequencies and in the, in the process of frequency assignment, they also regulate the space aspects. That's in Europe, we don't see it uh, so far. No? Here we have, we have it uh, more separate. Um, but uh, in the US example, no, it often even goes hand in hand. And if you speak to some of the engineers, they sometimes even confuse. If they speak about licensing, they speak about frequency uh, licensing. No? Um, okay. That's... Yeah, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. Yes, indeed. So the Americans, they, okay, they use the same process for 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the FCC is the Federal Communications Commission, is the telecom regulatory authority. And as they are through as part of the telecom uh, regulations, they are also uh, responsible for the frequency management. And uh, they are issuing licenses to, for, to satellite operators, which are attribu att attributing the frequencies, but regulating uh, space debris avoidance, et cetera, et cetera, uh, liability and so on within that process. No? In Europe, and therefore, they in Europe, organize auctions. Yes. yes. They organize they, auctions. Mm, uh, auctions, um, uh, they decided, in fact, um, uh, many years ago that in the satellite area, they wouldn't do auctions. They have done auctions in other areas, as we also did in Europe for 4G, 5G, etc., no? where, in fact, uh, the, the mobile operators had to make a very billion euro bits uh, to operate the national network. In the, in the satellite area, uh, is in fact, uh, is an exception. Um, only very few countries in very few cases have done auctions on satellite frequencies. I think Brazil, Brazil did it 10 years ago uh, and some other one, two cases. It has never been really introduced in this area. Maybe it comes in the future, um, but not so far. Okay. The issue is more if you have constellations like SpaceX with, uh, I don't know how many is the latest plan. Uh, at some point in time, it was 30,000 satellites. I think now almost 6,000 are already up there. Um, well, no, and this is only SpaceX. So one web and Telesat and the others. So what was always an issue and now becomes really a, a massive issue is how to leave uh, late coming, emerging, developing nations, the possibility to do their space activities in the future. It was always an issue no? uh, already when the space treaties were adopted, uh, decolonialization period in the 70s, no? uh, equal treatment, non-discrimination, developing countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, uh, for years, it was more like a high-level policy. Mm -hmm. Now it becomes really a, a, te a technical fact issue because, well, in the in the real orbit of SpaceX nowadays, no, in exactly this orbit, nobody else can put a satellite because they are so closely in one row, no, as you can see it in a in a clear night, etc. One after the other in a chain. So if you would like to go into exactly this orbit, it's impossible by facts. So it's monopolized. No? Of course, you can go a few, uh, few kilometers up or down. It's still possible. Yeah? But um, in the same orbit, it's no longer possible. OK, there you go. Is there an international? Uh, registry uh, where uh, do we need to, I mean, uh, standardization process, uh, international registry of companies and uh, is this possible actually? Uh, yes and no. Um, we have two things. One is the space object register of the United Nations, where in fact the member states register or notify, notify their national space objects, be it governmental or be it non-governmental. Yeah? So if you are a Greek company and you launch your own satellites, yeah, uh, Greece has to establish these satellites in the national uh, register and then has to report um, uh, uh, the entry and the details to the UN register. The big issue is this is done after launch and countries have a limited uh, practice of really coping with their obligations. Yeah? Sometimes it comes months later, 
or, or sometimes it uh, it never comes. No military spy satellites; they are typically not registered. Uh, some countries they they take two years until they send the information. Uh, some countries send information which is extremely limited. Um, but okay, that's uh, that's uh, how it is. The issue, the main issue nowadays, is it's done after launch. Okay, but if things are changing, no? if the company, if the satellite is sold from, as I said earlier, no? if if uh, company A from one country sells the satellite later to company B from another country, well, it still remains in the register of the first country. And in the UN register, if you have a look, it will tell you, ah, it's coming from country A. While now it's already sold and under responsibility of a company in uh, country B. Uh, and um, uh, also the issues of you know, on orbit servicing where two objects are combined or in orbit manufacturing. Yeah? You bring a lot of pieces up there, okay, and now you build whatever, no? uh, big rocket or internet or space station, whatever you build uh, up there yeah? with lots of pieces. And, and for these, the, the whole registration rules and the practice, even less, they don't have no answers. Yeah? This, this is one of the issues. The second type of registry is a frequency register. So the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, they have what is called the Master International Frequency Register where in fact um, also satellite frequencies used by a certain country and its operator are entered into this register. Yeah. Um, but well, no, that's only two aspects and they are unconnected. Yeah, uh, the, the ITU register has nothing to do with the space object register. They are not aligned uh, at all. And it's uh, subject to completely different processes by different organizations, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no, no real linkage uh, between them. And then, thank you. Uh, is there any question from the students actually? Yes. In the chat, I don't see anything. Okay, so Ingo, uh, we really don't want to take more of your precious time to, uh, because it's late in the evening. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was extremely helpful and uh, uh, your lecture today. Uh, would you be so kind to send us uh, the, the Yes, I, I will. Presentation in order yeah. to... Yes, no, yeah. I, I, I send it to you either tonight or, to, or tomorrow, uh, okay. and then you are free to distribute it. Uh, the, some of the economic slides, uh, as, as you have seen, they are a bit, yeah. not the, the very latest one, but with the sources, you find also the, the very latest one, if somebody is, is very interesting on, on this. Or just contact me uh, if, if you are looking for something specific. I can certainly also help with it. Yeah, and otherwise, it was my pleasure. Thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully, it was interesting. And then uh, I'm looking forward to coming in July. Uh, sure, sure. We will be we will be really happy to have you here with us. Yes, in Saloniki, indeed. Yes. Okay. Yes, for so, the summer school, actually. Absolutely. Everybody absolutely. So. Yeah, Thank very you.